Good morning, how are you doing today? Bob Folks here for the Gilly Glue. We're out in the shop today. I was intending on being outside and uh, being able to talk about some finches and do some things out in this bright sunshiny day that we have out here. We've had an incredible uh, couple days, but the last 24 hours we've probably had a 20 degree temperature swing. So we went from, uh, you know, Minus, or excuse me, plus 10 to uh, minus 15 this morning. So we've really changed up some things. So we uh, decided to move indoors where it wasn't quite so blustery and quite so windy. The sound and the light isn't quite as good, but we're here and we're gonna give it a go. We wanted to talk uh, a little bit about a lot of things really, <laughs> uh, but the uh, we've had a lot of people comment uh, about some raptors and things around, uh, around their feeders. Seems to be an increase in numbers of raptors being around. Um, traditionally or more commonly it's either a sharp shin hawk and or a cooper's hawk that uh, frequent uh, around feeders that said could be merlins could be any any of the raptors for for sure but the uh, the sharp shin and the cooper's hawk seems to have become adaptive to uh, having lunch around feeders so they're very difficult uh, to uh, identify because they're so very similar um, it's one of those things though uh, you have two things that you look at individually and you can't really tell which one's which but yet when you get them side by side you go oh wow yeah you know you're very easily able to identify which one's which and obviously that doesn't happen very well for us uh, at, at our feeders often it's very very quick it's just a flash something that flies by it may catch a hit a bird uh, it may land close by we have people landing on their railings we have you know people landing out in the yards with uh, their prey that they've caught uh, and and then you have a chance to ID them a little bit better but I just want to go over a couple quick points and then we want to talk about some finches um, the Cooper's Hawk uh, which is you know considerably bigger than the uh, sharp shin hawk and that's kind of one of the main characteristics that I like to kind of gauge it upon and firstly we'll talk about the the, the, the female of the raptors uh, are traditionally the largest uh, I know that you know depending it's all can uh, varies a little bit but certainly the females are the largest uh, of those for instance uh, a female uh, sharp shin might be as big as a male uh, Cooper's Hawk, or, yes, Cooper's Hawk. So there's a little bit of variance in there. That's a tough time getting that out. <laughs> uh, but so with a, a, a very large female Cooper's Hawk, for instance, uh, we're talking upwards to about 20 inches. So here we have the tape so we can see, just in relationship to me, how, how much how big uh, that hawk can be. So size alone, when you see uh, a bird come into your yard, uh, I mean, there's, I've talked about this before a little bit with, uh, with our uh, abilities and what we try to hone our skills and continue to, to get better and better and better at not only hearing birds uh, to be able to ID them, but when we get that very small window of opportunity to take a look at a bird, we, need to have very, very, uh, fuck, <laughs> better cut that out. We, when we get the chance to take a look at a bird, we have a small window of opportunity to be able to make that ID. And we wanna hone those skills so we can zero in on the appropriate parts of their bodies to maybe help you out. Now I really liked what uh, one of the, one of the, uh, field guides that I use on a regular basis, both on my phone and on my iPad, is the Audubon Guides. Yeah, I really enjoy it uh, because of its calls, I really enjoy it because of its descriptions and photography and what have you, but it, I just wanted to read you one thing that it says here about the, uh, the Cooper's Hawk. Um, so it's bigger than a sharp shin, with a relatively bigger head, longer tail, and thicker legs. I really liked the thicker leg part, because if you see a sharp shin hawk, it has pencil thin, little wee skinny pencil thin legs. Uh, among some other features that are very identifiable, size, you know, that type of thing. But the, and then the other thing that I really, really, really like to be able to ID, and I wanted to show you here in this uh, photo, 
that I think is very descriptive of the uh, Cooper's Hawk and how you can tell it apart from a sharp shin. Now if you look at the tail, and I'll see if I see how layered the tail is there. You can see it's almost fan-like at the bottom. It, it layers it, it layers over top of one another, it kind of fans together, and it, it's very representative of a, of a Cooper's Hawk and how you can tell the difference. So if you see that layering of the tail, and quite rounded actually, on the bottom of their tail, you know then that we're talking about a Cooper's Hawk. Sharp shins tends to be square across the bottom when they're, when they're perched, and then size is, is the difference, and then pencil thin little wee legs and a small, small head uh, in comparison somewhat to the body. So that's a, a few things that I wanted to go over. And when we're talking about uh, IDing via, via sound, <laughs> nothing better than to get into this to play around a little bit. So before we get too much further, I just wanted to get to our favorite bird, and play the spring sound of a male and female calling back and forth to one another, uh, um, talking through the, the, the breeding process. So the female sings first, male sings second. Have a listen. Female. Male. Female. Male. My mom always said that the cardinal was saying, oh, pretty girl, pretty girl. <laughs> sort of sounds like that too. Anyway, on to the finches. Uh, we've certainly seen an increase uh, of numbers of American goldfinch in the last little while since Christmas time uh, back into the area. I really have some a bit of a theory on that in that the uh, I, I correspond with a few people up in the closer to the boreal forest and all through our cold spell and all through the the time that we were here uh, we had no finches they had all kinds of finches up in the boreal forest they're a lot smarter than we are they knew it was going to be sub-zero temperatures and they got the heck out of here and went up into the bush where there was ample food the cone crop is quite prevalent this year, so the finch forecast in the fall suggested that our winter finches may not be as abundant this year simply because the cone crop was such a high yield in the boreal forest. So we're stocking spruce cones, the cedars and the seeds on the cedars, uh, the pine cones and all the, the grasses and uh, the lush growth that was in the boreal forest this past growing season made an abundant source of food which dictates whether we'll see a large number of birds coming to our area throughout the winter. So over since Christmas and through this uh, January thaw that we've had, though our finch numbers here, American goldfinches in particular, dark-eyed juncos, I had American tree sparrow at the feeder yesterday, so we're starting to see an increase in numbers of, of those birds and the activity of birds. So shall we see any red poles and, and uh, pine siskins and things? Some predict that there may be an influx of those into the area over the next little while. And February is that sort of starting point to spring in my opinion. A lot of the early nesters are starting, so the ravens and crows, the barred owls, the great horned owls, all those things are starting to really uh, ramp up their nesting process which takes place starting in February and gets, you know, barred owls for instance will have chicks on the nest hatched by mid-February often. So it's really coming into that time frame. So the, the things change a little bit. The, the early nesters, like the cardinal that I just played you, they're considered an early nester as well. So those, those are the things that we may see change. So I just had another little couple of things. And, uh, common red poles, for instance, if we should be lucky enough to see any of those this year. I have a reference book that I really, really like, and it talks about red poles and, and, as a winter finch and stuff. And this is a, a Canadian guy. Uh, Chris Erdley is his name. I love his book. He has a whole bunch of different books. We have several of them at the store if you're interested. Uh, but he does, so for instance with red poles, we're talking about five subspecies of one species of birds. So he has a reference chart here that you can see that he goes through the different subspecies uh, and I being able to ID them. For instance, when you talk about a common red pole as a, compared to a, a hoary red pole, 
same bird, but a little bit different to be able to ID them. So he talks about those diff those things. So again, start to get your uh, ID skills honed by referencing some of these very, very good things. It goes through all kinds of different descriptions of things, of course, which to show location and nesting area and breeding ranges and, and those those kind of things. Great, great, great book. Also for the raptors, and I just brought it out here for the raptors and, and things, he also does, and we have all these in stock, he also does the hawks and owls. It's kind of very uncommon to have hawks and owls, and this one is sparrows and finches, but they, they relate in a lot of different ways. And look at this beauty on the back page here. <laughs> Lots of snowy owls around also. Uh, so get ready. Perhaps we're going to see a little bit of an influx. Some people at the store have been telling us that they've seen some red poles, uh, been around their feeders. Um, you know, as I say, I saw an American tree sparrow around our place yesterday. That's the first that I've seen those for quite some time. Uh, lots of juncos have showed up again. So pine siskins. Uh, there was a report uh, of some uh, crossbills that came down out of the boreal forest and were up uh, a little bit north of, of uh, here, of northeastern Ontario. But again, they had moved down out of the boreal forest. So that might indicate that the cone crop is getting eaten up and they're moving to other areas where there's more food. So keep the feeders filled. And one other note about some sightings and some things that just in general that I uh, wanted to kind of talk about is that fox sightings. People have been reporting lots of, uh, seeing lots of foxes, not only in their yards, but running across the road and, and uh, around. And I, you know, I really think that we're seeing an increase. We've, I've talked about this quite a bit in the past where we, we've had basically every summer since 2012 in uh, Eastern Ontario, we have had lush growing seasons. Now there's been some peaks and valleys of that and some, some areas that were hit a little different than others in terms of less rain, more rain, that type of thing. Last summer we didn't have the heat we normally have, uh, but we had lots of rain, but we still had lots of lush growth. So we had lots of pine cones and apples and what have you. And two or three years ago, we saw a very high uh, rodent population. So people were reporting, tons of mice that were in their house. And some people that said, you know, I've lived, one, guy, one uh, customer of ours in particular had a shop and he said he'd been working in that shop for 18 years and had had the odd mouse, but he, he was inundated with mice that particular year. I'd say that was probably around 213, 214, maybe into 215. Uh, even so much so that in his shop, he just had uh, insulation and vaporberry, had no finish on the inside of his walls. And he was telling me that one day he looked across the shop and that the plastic was moving and he couldn't figure out what was going on. There was a snake that had got in somehow and got in behind the plastic in the insulation where the mice were and was getting at the mice. So when you got a snake come in, you know you've got lots of things in, in, in and around. So, so with that and why I'm saying that is that when there's lots of food, there's lots of babies. So whether it's birds or mammals or whatever, so a fox, for instance, eating lots of mice, lots of squirrels, lots of red squirrels, all kinds of food, the numbers of pups will increase. And I think we're seeing the results of that right now. I personally have uh, saw lots of foxes running around. They're becoming more urbanized also. So we also know that, that they're certainly around feeders more, around backyards more. Uh, barred owls are getting around feeders more because there's mice eating there at night. Uh, my daughter had an owl pellet in her, in her tray of her fly-through feeder when she didn't couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> so I went and looked and uh, went over to her place and, and sure enough it was an owl pallet. So there was obviously had been an owl landed in her feeder at night and was checking underneath to see what was there for food. So we wanted to go over a lot of things, get your feeders filled up, get your eyes tuned, get your ears tuned and get ready because I really think we're gonna see some great, great, great birds coming to the feeders very soon. Have a nice day.